You have to come tomorrow. Inshallah. Now, if you came, you did say Inshallah. If you did not, you did not promise. It's God willing. God willing. God don't want me to. God want me to. So this morning, uh, leaving Petra, and this in Wadi Musa, that's the guy who did win. His name is Sammy, young one. He was a tourist guide. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I know him well. And he was the first that they did announce yesterday who did win. Anyhow, maybe you heard yesterday about shooting. Yeah. That's one of the ways even authorities, I think all of Jordan were shooting yesterday. <laughs> and that's remind me in 1993, I was having a group staying at the Petra Palace Hotel. At that time, there was the old wing that had 33 rooms. And uh, I was in the lobby at that time. There wasn't any TVs in rooms, but I was in the lobby watching TV, election, having beer. Then they start shooting here. It came down to be people at that time in 93, and they said, Michelle, what's going on? They were scared, honestly. And they said, well, uh, everything's OK. I said, Michelle, is there a revolution? Is something happening? I said, no. Everything is perfect. <coughs> Everybody is happy. I said, well, they are shooting. I said, yes, because they are happy. I said, oh, if you are happy, you shoot. I said, yeah, that's what they do. I said, then they said to me, if the people get upset here in Jordan, what do they do? I said, they go to sleep early. <laughs> Even authorities, since about 15 years, trying to encourage the people for celebration, for wedding, graduation. Uh, inviting them to use, okay, you'd like to hear the shoot, use the, uh, uh, the you know, the uh, uh, fireworks. Fireworks, exactly, thank you. Well, we still have our AKC. The fireworks, that's what can have the sound, and it's nice, colors, you know. Exactly, that's what they start here doing, but. Uh, no way of authorities to controlling the whole country. You know, they could control sometimes anything in a village. But election. Anyhow, look on the mountains on your left. You could have the last view for the mountains of Petra from here. Again, you could see the highest mountain with the white shrine on the top. How high is it? Take to get there. Well, actually, a question about how long it takes to get to the top. When you reach, if someone, let's say, wants to go there, he cannot tour Petra the way how we did yesterday. He have to go all the way down straight, yeah? Then hiking up, when you reach the foot of the mountain, hiking up, it's about, it takes about three and a half hours to four hours. Mm -hmm. It's very hard climb and there is a CD was made for King Abdullah acting as a guide a very famous the most famous guide in Jordan and uh, he did hike up there with one of the American uh, journalists they are still celebrating anyhow and uh, he did reach the top there that was something like about six, seven years ago. I think I saw the, uh, on TV. On TV, yeah. Uh, then we'll talk about the Crusaders. That will be today. Plenty of time to answer all your questions. Headdresses. Oh, oh. Giving juice, offering juice. Why don't we stop here, come on, and get free juice? We did elect for them. All the group elected yesterday. Am I right? Yeah, we came, yeah, we, we we came after, after two donkeys, but before the one. <laughs> now, headdresses. There was a question about the colors, the girls, at what time they start wearing headdresses, and so on. Now, headdresses used by the men, first of all, that's not religious. Okay? I do wear headdresses in cold weather. Even we have people that wear headdresses, men, all the year round. Even they are better than hat, you know, in such weather, dry heat, yeah. When, uh, uh, you know, the hat is just protecting the, mostly the head, yeah. 
that these headdresses protecting the head, the neck, and the shoulder. And there is several ways how to wear it in case of summer or winter or sandstorm. Yeah. And could be used as a scarf. Now the colors used by the men. Maybe you have seen in this part of the world while traveling, people wearing white headdress, black and white, red and white, right? These are the typical colors. And we in Jordan, people in Jordan, they think red and white is a real Jordanian color. Yeah. No. If you could watch Saudis, you know, sometimes if anything in Saudi it shows the king or the Saudi people, they wear also the red and white. Even here in Jordan, we do have national songs for the red and white headdress. We call it Kufiya. There's more than eight songs for the headdress. For the headdress, yes, sir. And if you ask most of the Jordanian, is this a real Jordanian color? Definitely, they will say, yes, it is. That's the story now. Headdress, until about 90 years ago, was plain white, or green, or black, or beige, you know, or red. These are the colors. Red and white is what? If it's not Jordanian, it's what? It's British.
we use extreme we use extreme crushes. It's it's okay, it's fine, but there is a lot of gravel. There is a lot of gravel and it's very, very easy to slide. So please be very careful with not to twist your Diana Jones on the last crusade in Petra. Yeah. The last 15, 20 minutes shooting was in Petra and the gorge. But o only for the for the scene because yeah. of course it's a completely side yeah. <laughs> then the second movie is, uh, you know, there is a new movie called The Kingdom of Heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it talks about Renaud de Chatillon, Saladin. Uh, the last shot to be Richard Lane Hall. So you go out to the movie. Renaud de Chatillon is the real estate. I think. B, if you pay that much money, travel with me across the world, give me a chance and I'll deliver, huh? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me well? Yes, uh, yes. If not, it's channel two on your audio devices. Channel one, channel two, I'm on both channels. <laughs> fine, fine, be that way. Well, we're here on Umrasas, the custom map of antiquity. It started as a business, uh, uh, Nabatean outpost on the caravan trade route. But then the importance, the strategic importance of it was realized by the Romans and by the Byzantines as well. Byzantine Castromepa was a military station and the ruins that you see behind you, this wall, is actually surrounding Byzantine military camp and they have a, a detachment of uh, uh, cavalry here that was guarding the routes and uh, the trade routes and also in case of nomad invasion on a smaller scale would be able to hold the area well. Well, obviously if there was a military encampment on a permanent basis, civilians also were settling around here. This area was excavated only partially, but I have to give a credit that whatever was excavated revealed buildings in a very good state of preservation. So if you would like to think back, and we've been to monasteries from the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th centuries, and we've seen some structures and we see some mighty churches, but we're saying where the laymen lived, I mean, not versus clergy, but you know, what, what the real life is. You see houses over here? That was not probably houses of common folks, maybe of the military officers, but it gives you a very good idea of this uh, personal dwelling of uh, the people from very late, late antiquity, early medieval era. And this is very fascinating because there are very few places where you can see it as well. Mm. Unfortunately, for what, you know, for a variety of reasons, there were Muslim cemeteries. You see, wherever you see the hills, even where we're, st we're standing here, something under us is unexcavated. And where there is a Muslim cemetery, as Michelle just mentioned, there is no possibility of excavations. Mm. Now, what Byzantine military and secular dwelling have to do with the pilgrimage? Father Ilya, Crusader Castle, what's this all about? Secular building from this century, am I disappointing you? Well, I'll try not to. <laughs> what does it mean a permanent Byzantine detachment? If we have a military base of economically advanced state on a permanent basis, what does it mean? Who stays here? Officers. What does officer mean? Money. Paid money. Mm. Economy. People of faith, what would they do? Build the church. Build the church. What will they do with the church? You know, the cheapest they was, oh, look how it's nice, it's all plaster, it's all plastic, it's all permanent. No, they're going to invest because the best goes to God. God comes first, everything else comes secondary. So far today there were 12 churches excavated mm. with Here? mosaics yeah. inside in this immediate area in Castro Mepo itself. What year are you talking about? Oh, we, we're talking about the 7th century, 7th early, you know, pre-Arab invasion, pre-Arab invasion. We're going to see three churches, three and a, three and one tenth of percent of a fourth church. 
And even that, whatever is exposed and whatever the value of the, and the quality of the artwork that was, that was found here, may decide to be enlisted on the World Heritage Site, one out of three wow. in Jordan. Wow. So the quality of what you're going to see under this canopy over there is absolutely superb and unprecedented. There are a number of other churches, especially in the of Medaba. Unfortunately, we cannot get them, could not get get there by bus. You know, you need like a four wheeler because obviously roads shifted and villages are no more and it's in the desolate areas. But here we have a pers uh, uh, perfect access. And I'm thinking for us as Orthodox, it's very, very important to trace the history of our faith and development and artistic expression. So we're going to see. Those of you who've been to Italy and Soravenna, so beautiful churches, uh, beautiful mosaics and, uh, on the walls. Over here, walls did not survive. So we didn't know how walls were decorated, but we can see very precious floor mosaics. Another thing is, after we're going under the canopy, please do not disperse, even if you'll see it. Uh, there is an elevated platform that you can go over the mosaics and see them without walking on the floor. It's, it's, very, it's very precious. But then please do not disperse, because there is tendency. Some people want to take their time to look, some others not. Because I want to show you something very, very special that you're not going to see anything else. And I'll give you a chance to feel a little bit like Indiana Jones. <laughs> okay? And not because I'm so great, but because one of uh, local Bedouins sold his trick for me and not for much for a picture <laughs> of me with him <laughs> anyway 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 piece of pottery anybody interested oh. as a memorial from Pastor and Mepa yeah. uh, if you look under you it's littered with pottery well anyway so what to see here after after we go to see one church That's and something of Indiana Jones you can step inside of the buildings be very careful of the snake and scorpions it's a perfect dwelling for them Although we haven't seen many so far, that means that they're not here. Another very important thing, but I'll give you more explanation when we will arrive to the site. If you look, if you will, at the building, do you see the building yellow, gray, and white? Yes. Like a little, like an oasis on the outside of the village. Yeah. yeah. Right past it, there is a strange structure standing. Yes. Like with uh, uh, vertical, yes. uh, excuse me, right. horizontal black painted. Well, it's the uh, shadow of the scaffolding on the stylite tower. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Have you heard about the stylites? Oh, yeah. was telling me yeah. on top of the tower. Yeah. So this is one of the very few remaining still standing stylite towers and we'll be going there after seeing the mosaics. Okay. And you'll get a perfect chance to come near it, take a picture and yeah, bring a good memory. right under her it says Castron Mepha. Those of you who read Greek or Slavic letters can make it. Castron Mepha is what? Castron Mepha is Umrasas, where we are right now. Then there is Philadelphia. What's Philadelphia? Oh, Philadelphia PA, you know. <laughs> Beautiful Museum of Art, Hall of Independence. No. Philadelphia is Amman of today. Okay, Midaba. 
Do you remember what Midab is? Yeah. Place to get a good lunch. Exactly, exactly. So we have Hierapolis, uh, Hierax, Muba, and other places. But on the opposite side, where Castronomefa also had closest to the altar, is Hagiopolis. What's Hagiopolis? The holy city, the holy city of Jerusalem. What also is very interesting historical moment, that especially in the main mosaics over here, you see some distorted images. Those were images of animals and man. This is iconoclastic period where mosaics were destroyed and the gaps were filled. Like over here, uh, you can see a boat and the man rowing, uh, you know, rowing in the boat. But the image of the man and his hands were dest dest destroyed, destroyed and they were covered with, you know, uh, pieces of tessera just to keep the integrity of mosaic, but at the same time not to uh, yeah. expose the image. Uh, the, so the influence of Islam, is this the, the kind of Review. I can Review very briefly. Right. Well, it's very hard to say. There is a suspicion that uh, uh, Byzantine. Well, first of all, Islam was not, not viewed for a very long time as a separate religion. For the longest time, it was viewed as a hmm. as a semi-Christian sect. Hmm. And as there were always heresies, those of you who know a little bit about the history of church, there were always heresies, sects, movements. So Islam was not perceived as a particular threat. There would be another ecumenical council that is going to condemn Islam. When it is understood that Islam becoming something different, Byzantine emperors, without being able to root the Islam, started toying with the idea that it's probably some neutral ground can be found. But neutral ground always involved the, sec you know, the neutral ground in religion as well. And as we may imagine, the habit of kissing stone to dust is present not only with our contemporaries who go to the holy places, but also was the case in the Byzantine times where people were by far less educated and there were many contradictory holy spots and were people coming and were acting not as Christians necessarily, but maybe even as pagans. So the initial attempt was to uh, normalize, uh, quote unquote, according to the Orthodox standards, the veneration of the holy things, icons, mosaics and such. But it also was viewed as a positive thing because Islam did not, does not accept the imagery and say, well, if we'll restrain the veneration of the images, then we we'll probably will be, it will be able for our dialogue with Islam. Unfortunately, that never happened. But then to this category is the party within the church that supported the imperial thing saying, well, the true worship does not, in, does not need an image, especially that in early fathers were finding contrary statements about the use of images. Eusebius of Caesarea was really not very fond of images at all. You know, some early, uh, uh, some early fathers were questioning the need of images in the church. So there was this political party that started to get rid of all the images or images were used on neutral subjects as exclusively decorated art that would become later in the West. You know, more moralistic, pastoral, decorative, but definitely nothing to do with theology. But as it always in the East, the tension and attitudes grew higher. There was an open conflict. And as we understand, Orthodox, those who iconophiles, those who defended the icon, started to be prosecuted. And prosecution was launched by the emperors. And it was supported by the church higher-ups. And it lasted about 150 years. And it was not until after passing the decrees of two ecumenical councils, the 6th and the 7th, the veneration of the icons was restored. <coughs> Actually, a very interesting thing is that we have a lot of monastic tendencies in the Eastern Church saying that monastic life is preferable to married life, bishops can be only monks and so forth. So the monks were given much higher authority. Why that? It's also a tribute to iconoclastic period because the monks, as a lay movement that was easier for lay people to relate to the monks, they were orthodox in time with the hierarchy in their eyes gave them up. Mm. So, and of course, since that point when mon monastic supported the iconophiles, they were given much more credit mm -hmm. as far as the rulership of the mm -hmm. church and the canons were written that only monks can be elected to become bishops mm -hmm. and they were given that privilege of their support of orthodox mm -hmm. you know doctrine mm -hmm. historically so i have nothing against monastics don't get me wrong but you know that exaggerated tribute uh, to the monastic movement is partially due to the period of iconoclasm it was actually quite brutal and bloody so here you can see the evidence of that iconoclasm but i invite you to continue to the other church because there are more mosaics to see. What? This was a column that supported the, the, the roof. And over there you can see a little, well, it's 
pentagonal, octagonal thing. That was the pulpit. Those of you who've been to the Inn of Good Samaritan saw the Palestinian pulpit. Now we can see them, they're known to us more from the Western Church, but actually it was part of the Orthodox tradition, what St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil, they would go up <coughs> what, to the pulpit, to the cathedra, to the cathedra, and they would preach from it. So they would be standing a little bit loud. There was no speakers, and not everybody had such strong voices as Michelle or Father Jim. So they needed a little amplification, so they needed to be a little bit higher for them to be seen. Another thing, you can see a little uh, elongated opening over there. That's where the altar table stood, and under it were remains of... The father, like, oh, no, I don't know. I This I'm really happy to stay away from the camera. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> So since you're probably not going to chisel it off and try to sell it in Sotheby's, I'm showing you, but don't tell your friends who might do that. Because this is something precious. This is called the Church of the Lions. Why the Church of the Lions? Because there were two lions found here in the book of mosaics of Jordan. Uh, when it was fully excavated and cleaned, the picture of this mosaic that is right under us, we are in the oh, older area right now, was discovered and found. And right here, there are two roaring lions facing each other. And that's why it's called the Church of the Lions, because, of course, there is no way to tell what was the dedication of this church. Oh. Okay? But here you can see... Please come closer, everybody, please come closer. Пожалуйста, поближе подходите, чтобы увидеть можно было. Don't forget that today, when we are done, we are going to take you to the mosaic place, the place, the way. They will show you the way how they used to shape this mosaic. Yeah? The mosaic factory, we call it. I have a hard like time hearing you. It's something that was supported, like we knew. It's something nice to see. Yes. Okay? So I didn't hear very well what you were saying. Yeah. 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 The church had so much property, it gave people like Apronimus um, an excuse for taking the land.
Well, but why would they engage in such brutal prosecution of the icon of fire? to ride uh, and I wanted to say just a couple of words about the stylites because we, the site is under the open sun I didn't want you to bake uh, the most famous stylite is St. Simeon the stylite we're talking about the 6th century um, the origins of stylitism is not known what, what is a stylite? stylite usually understood as somebody who stops atop of the column who prays at, you know goes there and spends their years St. Simeon spent there decades and the stylite movement, albeit it was a bit strange, spread through the Middle East very rapidly. And not only it spread through the Middle East, it spread also through the, uh, through the West as well. And there were stylites known in Italy, uh, what today is Austria, France, Germany. However, Council of Salzburg near 1000 outlawed this practice as being too strange and too radical. A uh, particular area of stylitism was what is territory of Southeast Turkey northwestern Iraq and northern Syria, but not to say that stylists were not scattered around the area. Again, most famous of them was St. Simeon. Uh, uh, st uh, stylists were not only the people uh, over here. There's a sign. Stylists, st yeah. That's a new sign. That's a new sign. <laughs> the stylists were not only the people who necessarily stand the top of the column, but for instance, St. Seraphim of Serov also considered to be participating in a stylist practice because he prayed on his knees on a rock. Uh, there was St. Nikita the stylet in Pereslavl in Russia, and actually he was not standing atop of the column, he was standing atop of a little bit of elevation, uh, uh, wood, wooden, wooden block built, but there was like a ditch excavated for him, and he was standing in the middle of the ditch. I, I think it's... Yeah, 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 uh, 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 um, the, there were a variety of practices, of course, we're thinking if monk went atop of the column that he stayed there and he didn't come down, but there were monks who did come down, or were forced to come down because of the weakness of health. But most extreme examples were people who were standing atop of the column uh, without coming down, and they would lower the baskets, and people would be giving them some food and provide for their necessities, and they would come, and those stylites would uh, judge and reprimand and console and go hurt. We know that since Simeon, that since Simeon without getting down the column, converted two uh, tribes who were coming and first they were first first they were first they were uh, curious about him but then they were more attracted and drawn and came to hear the words of wisdom and they converted to Christianity.
It seems that this particular type of column, a tower, but to say it's 15 meters or about 50 feet tall, it doesn't have eternal structure, doesn't have eternal letter, fits into the category of what is depicted in one of this uh, Byzantine uh, emblems uh, found in Syria, where the letter was lean against the tower from the outside and the man is depicted as going up with two baskets as to bring some food to the stylite. We don't know exactly who live on top of that column, up, up on the tower. In fact, we don't know if this is exactly the tower that was used. It seems that way. I went up the scaffolding. You know, I didn't know how dangerous it was, so I please do not repeat what I did some years ago. And there is a little room on top there where indeed you can leave. And actually, if you stand, it says it depicted on the icon that the uh, order comes up, up to about your chest. However, the tower seems to be a little bit of fancy. Uh, so there are two theories that are not, however, mutually exclusive. That it may have been a stylet living on top of the tower, and when he died, his cult, cult developed very rapidly, because we see a church built near the present tower, and tower in that form and shape may have been may have been built as a memorial to his achievement. So anybody who comes would be instantly reminded, even in the absence of the stylet, of what had happened here. Okay? And they would go to church to pray, and there are some buildings of identified origin on the back, so it may be in a hostel for pilgrims or maybe military fortification. Well, that may be one suggestion. Of course, the other hypothesis is that it's actually the tower on which the stylet has well. One way or the other, what we know for sure that this element of asceticism was present in particular in this area. Somebody uh, mentions that in one of the ancient uh, documents the name of St. Samuel is mentioned in association with Castron Mepha. Who is St. Samuel? You know, that remains a big question and we're talking about the same person or not. Another very interesting element, even with those of you who went to Egypt, thinking about St. Anthony. St. Anthony begins to practice his monasticism on the outskirts of the village. What is the outskirts of the village? Wherever the garden stops, you know, not immediately next to the houses, but there were fields or the outskirts of the fields, so close enough to communicate with villagers in time of need, but far away not to be bothered by the everyday living, okay? So what you see here on this desert, but there were a number of wine presses that have been found in Castron Mepha. What says that there were vineyards all around here. If there were wine presses, there were vineyards. So close proximity to the village, you know, as you know, bird flies, it's not more than a kilometer and a half. So gives us an idea that it's a very, not only probable, but the exact definition of what an ancient sources tells us about the monastics that would be associated with villages and towns, but not necessarily living far in the desert. We have this imagine, uh, imaginative story about monks going far away in the desert and living there, for, like St. Mary of Egypt, you know, living there for decades. I'm not challenging the story of that nature, but it's impossible to survive without water. We should not forget about the human element. If there was no at least access to a little bit of food of a sort, but most importantly access to water, man you know, mon monastery couldn't survive. Those of you who have been to Masada probably noticed that monastery of St. Euphemius that did not last for too long, about 70, 75 years, as they were provide for their needs, for their gardens, for their waters, they were able to sustain their life there. As long as there was lack of water, they had to withdraw for objective reasons. So that is not dismantling of the story, that is actually objective historic reality and doesn't diminish the achievement of those great men. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I will stop on the bus. If you have any questions, you can ask me, take a picture, and we'll come back to the bus. Даже Семену Ступника растащили, там только один камень большой остался от основания. Там ничего больше нет.
Twitter и что-то новое. Вот это вот здание как-то непонятно. То есть могло быть гостиница для паломников.